time or when the other people are talking? Mm. Okay. 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 All right, let me. Hello, welcome, welcome. We're gonna give everyone a moment to get into the space. Uh, as you're getting into this space, you're welcome to introduce yourself. Um, we are going to get started in a moment. Uh, this will be an interactive panel, and so we want your participation. So go ahead and start by introducing yourself and your affiliation. Uh, and Erin, we can go ahead to the next slide as people are coming in. All right. Hopefully everyone knows what they're here for. We're here today as a part of our celebration of Black History Month. Uh, with COABE and the COABE Journal. You're going to be hearing from some awesome authors today, including myself. I'm Daquana Harrison. I'm your moderator for today. I'm very excited um, about uh, the conversation and discussion that we're going to be starting today. And I want to really focus in on the fact that this is a starting point, right? And so this is not the end. Uh, hopefully you did not come here today assuming that by the end you will be able to uh, you know, know everything to do to make tech equity happen in your <laughs> program or state. Uh, but hopefully uh, our presenters, Aaron and Jen, will be uh, giving you some ideas that you can take and start to implement. Uh, and so please go ahead and continue to introduce yourselves. And we are going to get started. Um, before we uh, fully introduce ourselves, there's a few things that I want to just pinpoint for everyone. We have been in this tech world, in this virtual world for a while. And so I um, hope that we can all have patience uh, and consideration for each other as we, um, you know, possibly come up with tech issues or anything like that. Uh, so please bear with us. Uh, we already had one small one this morning, so hopefully everything is going to go smoothly. Uh, but I'm sure there's many teachers online who can, um, you know, relate to the fact that if there's tech issues happening, the presenter is much more freaked out and worried than the people who are in the audience. Uh, so please bear with us as we uh, go through this today. We're really excited. We have seen people from Maryland, Texas, Texas, um, Delaware, uh, Ohio, Rhode Island, Portland, Maine, uh, Kansas City. We are so excited to be here with you all. And so we're going to keep on uh, moving forward. So continue to uh, put your affiliations in the chat as we move on to our next section. So of course we wanna introduce ourselves first. And so um, I am Daquana Harrison and Erin can move forward. Um, I'm Daquana Harrison. I am the owner of Elevation Educational Consulting Group. Uh, our mission is to really focus in on adult education and alternative education and support them in multiple different ways, including everything from trainings to uh, supports uh, with program modifications and et cetera, curriculum, all types of fun stuff. I also proudly represent the Maryland Association for a Adult Community and Continuing Education, otherwise known as the Mighty Mighty Mace uh, from the state of Maryland. And so I hope there are Marylanders here representing Mace proudly. I saw a few of them, Carly and Dana, uh, putting themselves in the chat. So continue with that. I'm gonna be your moderate, moderator today. And what we're gonna do for today is we're gonna start out with each of us individually talking about the work that we have done in that in our articles. And then we're going to do uh, some, some just allowing some flow in discussion. And so um, what we're gonna do is for you all, uh, we know that this is a webinar. And so we do want you to feel comfortable doing um, either in our Q&A, where you can ask questions, um, or if you want to, you can uh, do it within the chat. And so, um, Aaron, we can move forward. Uh, so please uh, know that today is all about three major topics for adult education. That is intersectionality, which Aaron is going to bring to you. That is 
tech equity, which Jen is going to bring to you. And then we're going to finish off with myself uh, looking at diversity, particularly diversity in hiring and staff. And so during this whole entire time, I want you to feel like you are talking to colleagues because that's what that is. And that's what we are. Uh, and so please put your questions in the, um, the chat or in the Q&A and we'll make sure to get to them um, most likely after the uh, presenter uh, presents. So we wanna keep moving. Uh, we're at 106. Um, we have 223 attendees, you all. This is very exciting. Uh, we're so happy that people are this interested in this topic. So we're gonna start with Erin, who's also today uh, providing our slides uh, and doing our slides. So thank you, Erin, for stepping up and doing that. Erin uh, is the Associate Director and also an ELL instructor for Lindale Neighborhood Association. Uh, she's gonna share with you a little bit. I know that a neighborhood association doesn't usually seem like somewhere where adult education will happen, but you know, we, we know adult education happens everywhere. And so Erin's gonna start off by telling us a little bit about what she does, um, but I also wanted to start us all off with a really um, uh, a question uh, for each of our authors that's going to help to kind of bring this together and start the conversation. And so the question I have here for Erin uh, is what has been the impetus behind and now results of Minnesota's adult education equity efforts. Been very excited to hear about this. Uh, so Erin, take it over. Thank you so much, Daquana. Uh, thank you for moderating today. We really appreciate it and for uh, sharing your work and Jen as well. I'm really excited to hear what everyone has to say and to respond to questions. Um, so um, like Daquana said, I uh, work for Lindale Neighborhood Association. Uh, my background is as an adult educator, and I am doing um, direct service education as an ELL instructor for Lindell Neighborhood Association's adult education program currently, in addition to doing, uh, uh, work, doing the duties of the associate director and overseeing some of the other community sustaining programming that we do. Um, Minneapolis is very interested in its neighborhoods and people are very sort of hyper localized and organized around their neighborhoods so um, we get to do a lot of cool collaboration with neighbors and local business owners um, and community partners um, doing community gardens doing um, uh, women's leadership program work with um, uh, Somali women Latinx women in our community. Um, and variety of community events, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and then also neighborhood committee work. Um, but our largest program, uh, which has been around since 2012 is um, an adult education program, mainly focusing at this time on ELL at different levels, English language learners and uh, supporting um, all of their goals. Um, it's a very place-based program. So we see our participants year after year, people leave to take a job and then come back to us. We're always there. Uh, so it's a really wonderful model of programming that I've been really proud to be a part of. Uh, I've been there since 2013. As far as, um, oh, and by the way, since I'm sharing, I'm not looking at the chat. So Daquana or Jen, feel free to interrupt me if someone has a pressing question in the chat. Um, so as far as the impetus behind and now the results of Minnesota's adult education equity efforts, it's kind of the answer to this is sort of spread throughout my presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and get into that. And then if people have questions directly to this or to anything that comes up along the way, please just chat it out. So um, <clears throat> my article co-authored with Dr. Patsy Egan is called Movement at the Intersections, Minneapolis, Race, Pandemic, and Adult Education. Um, I co-wrote this with um, the amazing Patsy Egan, who uh, works for uh, Atlas, which is an, a, a professional development uh, organization for adult education teachers in Minnesota through Hamlin University. Um, Patsy's a rock star. You may be familiar with her. She's a pretty big deal. I felt really honored to even be asked to, to collaborate with her. Um, and I want to point out this um, beautiful photograph. This was taken by uh, Christina Paler, who is uh, an organizer and community uh, a neighborhood employee of the central neighborhood, which 
is adjacent to Lindale where I work and uh, also adjacent to 38th in Chicago where George Floyd was murdered. So this is a photograph that she took um, from the, the site where so much activism continues to happen. So Patsy and I decided to write that our article is a reflection piece. Um, we wanted to sort of highlight this moment in time um, because I currently serve in neighborhood leadership and I'm doing direct service with um, community members and also am active in adult education. Um, and also because Patsy is involved with shaping professional development and training across the state for adult education. So she's part of a lot of conversations around reforming our field, making it more grounded in justice. Um, so with this article, we were hoping to capture some of the issues and the conversation happening in Minnesota adult education uh, as a result of and, and also intensified by the events of, of 2020. Um, and um, yeah, sort of my perspective as uh, a person doing direct service in this area, which is just a, my neighborhood is blocks away from the site of George Floyd's murder and the, the ongoing activism of Black Lives Matter at 38th in Chicago. I, I walked over there to be part of the vigil the day after he was murdered. It's very close. So very, this area is very close to my heart. Um, and um, what we decided to highlight were these, this idea of intersections. Uh, so by definition, intersections are busy, um, full of movement, full of tension, sometimes tragedy. And we chose this metaphor as a way of talking about the complex intersections that we work and live within. And of course, uh, nodding to this idea of intersectional identities within um, adult basic education professionals as a field and, and of course, among our students. Um, so we have intersections literally in the sense of 38th in Chicago, um, which remains occupied as an ongoing locus of Black Lives Matter activism, activism for communities of color, and as a memorial to George Floyd and, and all Black lives that are um, murdered by white supremacist police force. Um, and then a little more metaphorically in terms of an intersection between the pandemic and poverty, um, there's a sort of heightened systemic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic against people living in poverty, especially people like my ABE learners, most of whom are black and uh, immigrant or refugee, East African and Latinx um, in most cases. And many are unable to receive support during this time, even from the government as it's available because they're afraid of revealing an undocumented immigrant status. And then what these, um, intersections represent, of course, is for society in general and, and in adult education, it's an opportunity for greater accountability to um, the people that we set up at a painful disadvantage through racist policies, economic and social gatekeeping, and of course, violence. And this impacts us as a field largely of white teachers with students of color. So just a few instances uh, in the Twin Cities of uh, impacts directly of, of the uprising um, after George Floyd's murder. We had an adult learning center that uh, is directly across from Minneapolis's third precinct, and I do mean right across the street. Um, there was, as you may remember, a three-day standoff um, at the precinct there uh, on May 28th, 2020, starting on that day where the police barricaded the precinct to the public. They were continuously firing off tear gas and, and rubber bullets at protesters. This adult learning facility is also located adjacent to that infamous target that was burned and looted, the auto zone, uh, and a construction site uh, that was looted and burned in the ensuing police violence. We also had some other adult education sites that were damaged by fire, um, had broken windows, had facades sprayed with protest graffiti. And my organization in South Minneapolis um, happens to hold classes at a bank near the Minneapolis 5th Precinct. This is the area, if you remember from the news, where the National Guard was called in. Um, so the, that bank uh, where we've held classes for eight years and a nearby post office 
were burned down on May 29th, 2020. And the learners looked on from their homes in a neighboring apartment complex. So I'll show you. These are the three buildings of this. It's one of the largest, if not the largest public housing sites in Minneapolis or in the state. And um, this is across the parking lot from the Wells Fargo that burned down. So many, many of our learners live in these buildings and overlooked um, the protest that was happening. And uh, I mentioned this not to cast the righteous protests against anti-Black violence in a negative light, but just to call attention to the stories um, of how the police and the National Guard responded. Um, there was, it was very militaristic, it was very brutal, and it impacted our adult learners and their families directly. Uh, many of these learners have initially fled their country due to war and violence. And this past spring, they had to bear witness to fires, damage, this uh, outsized potentially police response and National Guard presence. And um, this may have resulted in another layer of trauma if you're living right next door to these events. Um, this is a quote from one of my students who lives, um, he lives in the tower to the left there. <laughs> uh, it was very scary. Most people in the buildings were not sleeping that night. All night we were looking at what happened and people were running out of the building because of the fire in the bank and the looting at the pharmacy as a Walgreens across the street. Two nights we were not sleeping. All of the people living here were afraid. So this is the Wells Fargo that, that they were watching. Um, and uh, the um, families who um, parents, grandparents are receiving adult education services in the area, they're coping with intersections of the pandemic, poverty, job loss, racial inequities, uh, anti-immigrant policies. And the uprisings led to a lot of complications in this already difficult situation. There was a food desert in the area due to damaged and boarded up stores. There was a suspension of public transit, which greatly impacted the folks living in the buildings that you just saw and the neighboring area. And they lost services like the post office and of course the bank. Um, there were weeks um, of uncertainty in this neighborhood. Another one of my students who uses a wheelchair uh, lost bus service and access to stores and facilities close to his apartment after the uprising, which is you know why those public housing buildings are situated there so people have access. Um, and so his quote was, was here, yeah, it's difficult to uh, go to another bank, another place. I have a friend who takes me in his car, but it's not easy. So he was relying on another person's schedule and resources just to meet his basic needs. And the reason I, I put this up here is not to mourn the buildings, right? The buildings are replaceable. The lives that are being celebrated through the protest are not. Uh, and the people that we serve in adult education uh, are largely people of color, many are refugees and immigrants who came here for safety and well-being. And because of police violence uh, and state violence, they have not found it. So while this COVID pandemic is highlighting realities to the barriers to success for ABE learners of color, uh, it's it, I feel like it's making them even starker. I think uh, the skills involved in daily living are even more complex and high stakes. Uh, they're navigating unemployment websites, eviction policies, communicating with police, managing their health, attending school remotely, trying to participate in elections um, and to be citizens in their communities, um, maintaining their food security, et, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a new urgency to a lot of the soft skills that we're already teaching in adult education, like effective communication, critical thinking, uh, if students have breakdowns uh, in these, then there can be very dire consequences under our current circumstances. Um, so the students at my site generally have very limited digital literacy and access. They are at the beginning levels of print literacy, English language proficiency. So in these times, we're really thinking about the purpose of adult education. And this is a moment where I wanna stop and, and ask for your feedback. Um, 
take a few seconds to think about this question. What is the purpose of adult education or some of us call it adult basic education? And just give me a response in the chat. What is the purpose of our work? Erin, this is Jen. Well, people are thinking, I thought you might want to know that there was a question put in the Q&A um, about that you could answer maybe. Are learners there in Minneapolis able to get back to their adult education services now? Some are meeting in person. A lot of them are still meeting remotely. And I think a lot of sites have taken advantage of uh, CARES Act funding or grant funding to get digital devices and access in the hands of their students at home. Um, it, it really depends who you're serving. In our case, so many of our students are elderly or at the beginning stages of you know, English language acquisition and literacy um, uh, instruction. So the digital literacy skills are also usually in a, a beginner stage. And so we've been teaching remotely a lot actually over the phone and WhatsApp, which has been a trip. Um, but I do know that across the cities, there are some sites, depending on school districts or, um, you know, the policies going on um, that are ever changing in Minneapolis Public Schools, St. Paul Public Schools, some have done some meeting in person. Uh, some are also making themselves available for students to come and pick up devices or pick up packets of work and take those home to do. So yes and no. <laughs> So you, you do have a huge response to your question here. Um, do you uh, want me to, I know you can't see them. Daquana, do you want to read them out or should I read them I was them just going to say, yeah, I can um, read out a few of them as they're coming in. Um, we started out with, um, with saying uh, to empower learners from with the beginning skills to be self-sufficient. Uh, some people said improving equity. Equity has come up a few times here. Um, ABE offers access to quality educational programs to assist students uh, was, a, was one um, and uh, to support college readiness and to realize their full potential. So individuals, families, and communities can thrive, uh, providing assistance for jobs and resources for lifting them up. Uh, to help people in our community achieve a better quality of life, support themselves and their families. Um, uh, learner confidence, moving forward towards goals, equipping people uh, to function in society, uh, providing educational opportunities for people to deny them in different ways, or which was denied to them different ways earlier in their lives. So, you know, a lot of uh, around the uplifting, of our students, um, both, uh, I would say, talking about uh, tangible skills, but also, also things like confidence and facilitating them, empowering them and things of that nature. So um, just want to give one more, um, maybe one more read here uh, to hopefully make their lives better and employment better after they get their GED as well as certificates from vocational areas. So a lot of people talking about the access and the importance of access to the education um, and in inclusivity as well. So um, really good, uh, some really good comments and hopefully everyone will get a chance to read through them. Thank you so much. Thank you for reading those out to me, Daquana. Um, I really appreciate the uh, direction uh, that, that these comments are coming from. Uh, we're here as uh, servants of the students, right? We're uh, here to foster their goals um, toward independence, toward self-realization, um, and uh, not, you know, to respond to stakeholders or those who have made investments in them. Um, we're we're um, we're not here to um, kind of further existing systems, but to join our students in, in building a more equitable future. So I really appreciate these responses. Um, I think also that it's clear that some of the systemic barriers that I've been discussing um, to race, uh, connected to race, language, immigrant status, they work against this purpose. And it's unjust for anyone to expect our learners to self-advocate entirely on their own within these systems that are designed to keep them in the margins. So. Um, as adult educators, this is also part of what we do. Uh, so to talk a little bit about um, 
responses uh, to these uh, questions of, of equity and being especially inspired by the people of color and, and their allies who are leading this extraordinary movement for equity and community safety. Um, some of the adult educators in Minnesota have come up, uh, come up with different responses to lift up uh, the learners and the families uh, that we serve and, and reach for a greater justice in our field. So uh, one example in 2019, our state uh, Office of Adult Education in Minnesota issued a Minnesota Adult Education Equity Statement. Um, and this is something that I can link to later if you're interested in uh, in that, but I, uh, having checked in with them about it, they said that this was sort of a, um, a formative viewpoint that they set an intention around. Um, I think it's hard sometimes to point to direct impacts of it because these statements tend to be a little bit general, but it's important um, at the same time, I think, to um, recognize equity as a goal at the very outset of this work. Um, we've just reinstated an adult education licensure in Minnesota. Uh, it was gone for a while, it's now back. And as part of this, licensed teachers in Minnesota adult education have to meet cultural competency requirements, um, including training on implicit bias and systemic racism. And there's a link here if you're interested in looking up more information about that. Atlas, um, which um, my co-author is the director of, uh, they're the provider of adult prof uh, professional development for adult educators in Minnesota. They began a cultural competency library with instructional and professional learning resources related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So there's a link to that if you're interested. Um, also, I think in addition to uh, a lot of trainings in the, the racial and in other equity areas, adult educators are advocating for and trying to build more opportunities for um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color to be leaders in our field and for anti-racist collaboration across the field. Um, one example, we have an uh, advocacy uh, committee within, our, um, within one of our, our state agencies um, that works with legislators every year to help formulate our, our legislation for adult education. Um, they have recently gotten um, a BIPOC advisory group to help inform some of the policies that they're advocating for. Uh, and those are BIPOC adult education professionals uh, representing their own viewpoints. And Aaron, I just wanna jump in real quick. Yeah. Uh, I just wanna um, note BIPOC. Uh, if you could go ahead and give the definition. Oh, I did. I did. It, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Yes. Yeah, I just want to make sure um, I saw some people ask that personally. So. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going by really fast when I said it. <laughs> I can. I should review that every yeah. time. No, it's fine. And we're at the two-minute mark for you. Great. Okay. Um, something that I've been part of and, and really believe in is a grassroots uh, group of adult educators and learners called IMABE. Um, we uh, issued a statement in response to George Floyd's murder by police, um, and you can see some of the things we asked people to sign on to and commit to as, um, oops, as part of this statement, amplify the voices of non-white teachers and students, uh, break down existing barriers to having more teachers of color in adult education, um, assess and reform classroom materials and evaluations to ensure that they validate student experiences, promote equity and justice. And these statements uh, of equity for our students, everyone is capable of learning, everyone has a right to learn, everyone brings experience and knowledge to the classroom, and all varieties of English are legitimate. So we invite you to sign this statement. A few of IMABE's actions, we have a, a curriculum which um, is a multi-level lessons that range um, from First Amendment rights to refuting stereotypes about your culture, voicing your political opinions on social media. Uh, we organize a statewide day on the Hill, which is virtual this year. Uh, and we provide advocacy support training for adult teachers, professionals uh, for ABE, and then lesson plans to work with your learners on working for change with their legislators. We have, uh, this, was, this was my thesis project for my master's in ESL, uh, on our website, a participatory ABE curriculum toolkit, which uh, provides all the tools for you to work as learning partners with your learners to develop units based on 
their goals and things that they need to learn in the classroom. Uh, we work on committees to uh, and support of, uh, support of the adding of our uh, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color Advisory Committee. And we provide a lot of curricula and trainings around representation for mental health in adult education. We have actual lesson plans to teach our students about mental health and um, around LGBTQ plus identities, uh, culturally responsive teaching, collective action around the shared equity concerns, both of ABE teachers and learners. So you can find all of this on our website, which is up at the top here. It's a Google site, so it's not a pretty URL, but <laughs> we're working for free. Um, and finally, I just wanted to share with you this image. This was on the boarded up front of our my Lindale Neighborhood Association office building in collaboration between staff and local Somali organizers. Uh, Iskashi means cooperation. Um, so this indicates we live here in English and Somali. Um, the idea being it's incumbent on people in power to listen and learn how we can best share that power so that people at all different intersections can move forward and breathe freely. Amazing. Thank you so much, Erin. And ending there is amazing uh, to uh, put that, again, those, those intersectionalities, right? And so while, uh, you know, people may come here uh, to America, you know, to get a different type of life and to maybe even uh, be, make sure that to not be a part of, you know, these kinds of, of violent acts. Um, and of course, a lot of times they don't know that it's even happening because that isn't well known throughout uh, uh, the world. Uh, but we live here such a, a great and strong way and about co collaboration and cooperation of all. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, so we want to continue on. Um, and get into our next uh, big piece. Again, continue to post in the Q&A or the chats. If you have questions or comments, the comments is best to put into the chat for sure. If it's a question that you explicitly wanna make sure is, is answered by our uh, um, panelists, please make sure to go ahead and put it in the Q&A so that it doesn't get kind of swept up with the conversation in the chat. Thank you all so much for participating so well in the chat. Please continue that. All right, so um, we are going to now move to Jen. Jen um, Vanek is the Director of Digital Learning and Research at the EdTech Center um, at World Education, Inc. Uh, as we did uh, with Aaron, uh, Jen, we want to kind of start you off with a, a question, a bigger kind of question that then kind of goes into your, um, your part of this. So how do we see uh, inequities reflected in perpetuating racial and economic dis disparity. So, you know, let us know because a lot of times it's there and it's it's noticeable, but people aren't making the connection, right? And that's the thing. So um, I know with your work, you're able to let uh, help us to see those connections and not only connections, but answers and solutions. So go ahead, let's start. Thank you so much, Sequana, and thank you, Erin. Um, that big question is actually <clears throat> was sort of the foundation of the conversation that led to the COIB journal article. Um, so I'm Jen Vanek. I'm actually joined here by my co-authors. I saw them on the participant list, Tom Citron Heisem, who is the consultant who runs the North Star Digital Literacy Assessment Initiative for Literacy Minnesota, Rachel Riggs, an instructor and um, really a teacher educator, I would say, Rachel, you can claim that space, um, working with Frederick Community College, and my colleague at World Education, Allison Asher Weber, who co-leads the Digital Us Initiative as well as so much other work in the area of digital inclusion. And we in turn, so I'm representing them on the call and we in turn are representing all of these other teachers you see listed here on the right who were participants in the strand meeting where we talked about the, the, the you know, that, that big question, you know, what is the intersection between digital exclusion, digital inclusion and, um, and racial justice and white supremacy? Like how do these things all come together? Um, so what I'm gonna share with you today are some highlights from that conversation to get, try to get to the answer to that big question, but more importantly, to start to have you think about how your work connects to, to these tensions and to the challenges that our learners bring with them in the classroom caused by 
digital exclusion created by barriers put up for them um, that make it difficult for them to get the access they need to support their learning and career goals. Um, so on the on the next slide, you'll see um, a a great quote that that was shared by um, a colleague of ours. Um, who wrote a paper for National Skills Coalition, um, Amanda Shilcock Bergson, or um, who who the National Skills Coalition has done a lot of really interesting work in this area in really trying to untangle um, the impact of digital exclusion on other aspects of lurker, of working learners' lives and adult learners' lives and. Through her research, she has found that there is indeed um, black workers com comprise just 12% of overall workers, but have 15% um, the 15 of the subset of workers who have no digital literacy skills and 21% of those with limited skills. The statistics are, are um, equally challenging um, and show for, for Latino workers. Um, so you, you know, this is, I'm trying as we go along the way, um, I'm just going to be trying to layer in some data that can help you understand the, the, the intensity of the problem here. And I will note too that when I'm done talking, I'm going to be chatting links to many of these things. It's really hard for me to chat and talk at the same time. So I'll get those links in there. On, this, on the next slide, um, I'd like you to just see a few other statistics. Um, so eight out of 10 middle skills middle skills jobs. Um, so skills that require use of technology generally um, require digital skills, yet um, 18 million households do not have access to broadband internet, 32 million adults cannot use a computer effectively, and half of Americans aren't comfortable using technology to learn. These, these statistics are uh, reported in our um, in the digital us report which again I will chat in momentarily um, and just give you a nice big picture um, of, of the, the issue around globally in the US or so globally yes but also in the US around digital exclusion and then one more example on the next slide um, you can see three pictures here go ahead and just advance through the animation Aaron <clears throat> um, you see you see two pictures here. Uh, actually, I came across this, um, I can't even remember when, but it was um, an, an NBC News report. Oh, I, and the National Digital Inclusion Alliance had an, a link to this NBC News report on um, the inequities around continued schooling during the COVID pandemic. So what you're seeing is a map of the city of Chicago. Um, and on this is the west side of Chicago, this is the south side of Chicago. What you see is a concentration of COVID deaths in these dark blue areas. Uh, what you also see is that these, oh, these are completely aligned to what you see for households with no internet access. And then I got really curious to find out to see if I could understand better the socioeconomic conditions in these communities in these neighborhoods. And so I was able to find this, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning and they had a lot of maps and data resources. And you can see here that race and ethnicity map for black communities map again on top of these two things. So you know we're not we're not talking about digital exclusion or digital inclusion or race even as like singular things rather there's an intersectionality across the lived experience of people that that that, that work to keep them from accessing their goals um, in concert so it's not just one barrier put up for them um, by dominant discourse by institutionalized racism by white supremacy but it's a it's all of these factors working in concert that get in the way of learner progress and success. So next Jen, slide. Yeah. Jen, before we go to the next slide, um, we had a question I think is good to ask here, uh, just because you're talking about like internet access and in households. Uh, you know, we had a question around rural areas and um, I think that this might also um, overlap with what you're talking about. And the question is, um, you know, any strategies for digital inclusion um, when your center is rural and poorly funded? Uh, so we can't loan out laptops or provide Chromebooks, for instance. Um, and so if there's any, uh, and you may not be able to answer right this second, but maybe at the end, if there's any uh, strategies you could do to support yeah. 
someone so like there that. Are, there are no tech and low tech options. And I know my colleague, Allison Asher Webner is on this call. Allison, if you happen to be um, here and want to chat a response to that, one interesting um, point that, that I want to bring up, if you get on the National Digital Inclusion uh, NDIA's website, they actually have a report that cites um, the impact of fo focusing on rural areas kind of is tends to draw attention away from the urban um, uh, connection deserts and broadband deserts. So there's this like the, the way the policy dialogue is being shaped right now, it's almost pitting development in rural areas, infrastructure, broadband infrastructure in rural areas with that of urban areas. So um, I'll let Allison, it looks like she's chatted a link to some more information on that. Um, so do check that out. So let, let's do go to the next slide. I'm really worried about the time here. Um, so all of this sort of came to a head for us. Um, you know, the, because of widespread concern and the racial uh, about white supremacy and the racial reckoning that was happening across the country because of the George Floyd murder. And so I just mentioned this for two reasons. I also live very close to this, the, the target, the, the police station, all of that is my neighborhood. Um, so in a sense, Aaron and I have very parallel experiences with all of this. The other thing I wanna mention is that we wrote this paper at the beginning of what I consider my personal growth in this area. And there are actually, if I could rewrite the paper, there are certain things that I would do differently because of it. Um, so thank you Daquana at the beginning for graciously saying that we're all on a journey and that it's a journey that that is unfolding gradually and needs to be consistently attended to over time because I feel like that's personally what my situation is. Um, since that time, I have totally redirected my work. I'm involved in a CTE online racial equity project with Urban Institute. My shape, my research with Portland State University, we have, we've kind of dropped our sociocultural lens and have shifted to a critical race theory lens because we are trying to be very intentional about understanding more deeply how, how race and white supremacy shaped the experience of our learners. Okay, so let's let's hop to the, <clears throat> to the next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with all of this in mind, um, with the pandemic, with the murder of George Floyd, we came to this, this digital literacy technology integration strand meeting at COABE with the understanding that it couldn't just be business as usual, <clears throat> that we needed to use the time together to really make a difference, to try to make a difference in the way teachers are, and we ourselves are thinking about these issues. So. We came together, we broke into small groups and we tried to answer these questions that you see on the stage, or sorry, the stage, the, the slide here. Um, first, how do we see digital inequities reflected in per perpetuating racial and other disparities? And what instructional strategies and program practices do we employ to mitigate the inequity um, and digital exclusion that BIPOC learners face? <clears throat> so on the next slide, I'm just gonna, basically what you see on the next slide here is a outline of the paper. We came together, you know, you, you saw it was a group of about um, 30, 25, 30 of us. And we came up with strategies that our, our programs or, or we personally were using in order to try to mitigate, mitigate the inequity and digital exclusion. And those areas focused in these three places. So dealing with access use, supporting teachers with professional development and understanding digital learning needs. So we have a poll here. I wonder if we could quickly pull up the poll. Uh, so it's, it's poll number one. I'm not seeing it yet. Are you, is anybody seeing it? There we go. So which of these prioritized strategies has your, your program prioritized? Which of these strategies has your program prioritized? Are you trying to deal with access issues? Are you supporting teachers with professional development? Are you trying to understand digital learning needs and addressing them? Go ahead and vote. And Jen, as they are voting, do you want me to go ahead and put all of those um, uh, links? Yeah, please that? do. That'd be yeah. great. All right, great. Uh, so here we go here. There's, let's see, make sure I have all of them. All and right. we can close the poll. I think we've had enough time just to get a sense of what's going on. Yeah, there's quite a few links there and I'm uh, gonna go ahead and send that. Uh, you should be able to do a, a select and be able to copy it and paste it onto like a, a Word doc or something if you need to. And can we display the poll results? 
Okay, so a lot of you are doing many of these things and fairly evenly distributed, a lot, a lot of support with professional development. That's, that's wonderful. Um, so what I, I, I really only have just a couple of minutes. I want to encourage you to, to look into the paper. Um, I've chatted some key links, um, or Daquana chatted some key links for me on specific activities, but let me just take a minute or two to highlight a few that I think are really, uh, that were really salient for me. So in terms of access, um, the Digital Navigator program is a new way of thinking about how to connect learners with devices, but and, and Wi-Fi, but beyond that, it's helping them understand how to use those, those technologies in order to so, like gain the digital literacy skills to fulfill needs and accomplish tasks that they need. So um, there are digital navigator programs all across the country. You can read about it in the digital navigator link that you have here. Allison, as I said, is co-leading one of these projects. And so I, I encourage you to reach out to her. If Allison, if you wanna chat your email. Um, so do check it out. Um, if you do have the means to provide lending devices, I've, I've provided a template or an example of a lending contract that you could use. And then I've also provided a link to NDIA's list List of low cost plans. So do check that out. In terms of addressing digital literacy needs, um, do check out the North Star Digital Literacy Assessment Modules and Curriculum. They, there are some free learning resources there and then the modules themselves are free. But if you would like to have information about the work that your learners do, you could get a very inexpensive site license. And Tom actually is on the call and he's the person to connect to about that. Um, <clears throat> There are a few other things. My co-author, Rachel Riggs, has come up with a, a, a strategy called creating a digital action plan. Um, a digital action plan is, is created by students to help them identify the digital skills they need to acquire, and then map out a strategy for them to both establish a timeline for building those skills and then track their progress. There's lots of reflection on the way. And the thing that's cool about having learners drive this process is that they have agency in their learning the teacher is able to then understand how they need to differentiate instruction. And more importantly, the teacher is not going to miss anything. You could assume, it's very easy to assume that you understand learners have a skill or not. So it, it, establishing learner agency and having the learners drive this process legitimizes their understanding of their skills, makes them full participants in the learning, and um, just supports the instruction that the, the teacher can provide. Uh, let's see. Uh, I also want to say one other thing about instruction. Um, optimizing Google Slides is really important because we know so many of our learners re rely on cell phones. So um, there is a link here to a YouTube video from Sherry Lahane, who's at Providence Public Library. Um, they have done a, she's done a really great job on mapping out exactly like the size of the font, how many things on the page, lots of vi important visual information that you can use in order to um, make sure that your, your slides are optimized for learner use. Um, so um, I haven't really said much about teacher learning, but it is incredibly important. Um, I think the final link on the slide here is a place for you to um, access a, an example of a teacher self-awareness and skills and comfort survey. Um, I say in the paper that it's really important that teacher professional development in the area not feel punitive, but that teachers have a sense to understand their own skills and comfort and then are supported in, in fulfilling, like meeting their goals. Um, so a self-assessment, this one is from Sabes um, out of Massachusetts, and this is a really excellent way to go about it. Um, if you, you can go to the next slide, Erin. If you have any other questions about a lot, of, a lot of what I've covered, do check out the paper. Also know that you can access a lot of media resources in support of this. We've had a webinar series going since March. Um, and so if, by going to the link here um, on the page, you'll be able to, um, sorry, actually I was, I'm not sure if anybody got that link, but, um, yeah, we have a lot of webinars you can listen to. Yes, and then finally, great. And then finally, my last slide here: advocate, advocate, advocate. Um, you are in a position to not only um, advocate externally, but also listen to your students. Give your students a chance to tell their stories about the impact of digital exclusion and the benefits of inclusion, so that you can advocate more effectively. Um, again, Digital Us Coalition and the National Digital Inclusion Alliance are both. 
great places to um, focus um, your advocacy and to also get more information about how you can get involved in this work. Thank you so much for letting us share some of some of um, our resources. And Daquan, I'm really looking forward to hearing a bit about your paper next. So great, and thank you. Whoa, resources galore, right? Uh, so hopefully you were able to catch that uh, set of links. I just took all of the links, Jen. Uh, so. Um, maybe we can get that back um, in the chats one more time in case people did not get a chance uh, to uh, to get the assessment link and other links. I see that someone is asking right now for the assessment link. We, uh, Jen talked a lot about technology. Um, we did want to point out, as someone uh, said, you know, it's it, you know, it's rural and urban uh, is a big piece of that. Um, but the urban centers are where we would be supporting more uh, people. And there is some conversation in Jen's article about uh, the disparities between the rural and the urban and how funding uh, has been being moved around. And these are the things that we have to be thoughtful of. You know, we have the IMABE uh, advocacy uh, hashtag and things like that. But our advocacy must also be, you know, thinking about how that work and how that money uh, needs to be pushed forward. And so I'm going to move us forward because I'm switching hats right now. And I just wanted to acknowledge we are going to run over a little bit, uh, just a little bit. And so those of you who are able to stay on, please do. Uh, I'm about to uh, go into some of the questions that have actually been coming up on the chat around diversity and staffing. And so I'm switching hats a little bit. I'm moving from your moderator uh, to the author at this point in time. And so um just a little bit about uh about me i already said a little bit about elevation educational consulting group we do a lot of really great work we're one of very few consulting groups that are in education and focused in on adult and alternative education and so i'm very proud of the work that we've been doing we've been around for going on five years now and so i'm extremely proud of that work uh before that i have been the Director of Instruction uh, for Adult Education Programs. Uh, I was um, the head of DC TANF program, and so all of the financial um, welfare benefits I um, was over for a while. And so I, I bring a lot of different perspectives. And of course, I'm also the president of the Maryland Association for Adult Community and Continuing Education, otherwise known as MACE. So I'm going to jump in. So let's go to the next slide. We're about to talk about diversity, but I want to get a poll up first to see what do we think um, will help to strengthen the field of adult education, because that's really what this is all about. So, uh, James, if you're able to pull up that poll here, so you are able to do all that you want. So if you want to do all, do all. If you want to do one or two of them, that's fine. So answer that question for us. What would help to strengthen the field of adult education? Um, and so as you all are, are getting that ready, as I said, we are going to have a discussion on diversity and particularly diversity in staffing. And uh, this question is important for our conversation. So I am going to give you a moment more and we can close it. And so uh, if we can display the results or put the results up to see what people are thinking about. Uh, so it is how I expected that most of us think all of these things, right? And so <laughs> even though there's a few things that popped up, um, so the ones that popped up that have slightly more uh, folks uh, voting for it is uh, more student-centered teacher uh, trainings and practices and more adult education-specific trainings and not the K-12 twisted trainings, which I am totally done with uh, being anywhere a part of, right? And so uh, thank you. Um, I bring these up because all of these are what can happen if we, or what needs to happen if we are really going to diversify our staffing. In my article, uh, Let Us Teach Us, A Diversity Call to Action for Adult Education, um, I speak to the importance of having a diverse staff, having a staff of 
teachers, of leaders, of directors, et cetera, admin person, support staff, who mirror your students? And um, I saw some people talk about wages and saying, how can I instruct my, um, you know, maybe I have a, a, a brilliant immigrant uh, student or a student who might be interested in, in taking forth their learning and becoming a teacher. How can I tell them to be a teacher in ABE or adult education with these low wages? Uh, so that is a great question. <laughs> and it goes into where we, uh, where I talk about in the article, which is the fact that a lot of, and we can go to the next slide, a lot of our history uh, has been uh, focused in on the fact that we come from a philanthropic background in adult education. It is quite often that our field um, has been, you know, really uh, dependent on middle class to upper class, particularly white women usually, who can take a pay cut, right? Who can work uh, 47 hours, 50 hours a week, um, and you know barely get paid for half of that time, right? So they have the ability to do those things. But if we are to uh, bring in diversity, we need to be thoughtful of the fact that if we are asking BIPOC people to come in and be a part of our, our teaching staff, we're going to have to possibly change that, that funding and change the way that we are, um, are paying people, right? So I want to move forward. So Erin, if you can move to the next slide. All right, so what I did here for our section is I took um, kind of the ending portion of my article and broke it down. And so we're going to just dig into each of these little sections. Um, I think we have three sections in total um, and um, and want to dig into each of those things. And so, you know, this call, I wanted to be sure to, to focus on the fact that it is for all of adult education throughout the U.S., right? So this is not something that matters only in big cities. Um, and, and, you know, quite often that's what people want to focus in on. Um, I want us to, one, get the idea out of our mind that when we say people of color, we are saying Black. Uh, I do trainings on cultural competency, and uh, it is very interesting when people say, oh, all of the examples were examples um, about Black people, and it's really not. <laughs> I literally make sure not to do that. And so when people say that, I know what's happening is they're hearing me say people of color. They're hearing me say minorities. They're hearing me say um, BIPOC and translating immediately to Black. That is not the end all of um, the conversation that we need to have around diversity and we have to change that. And so um, we are talking about throughout the entire United States, we need to change and adjust our field. And I, I want uh, to put a pin there on that viable career choice, right? And so people may be wanting to do this and then looking into it and realizing, whoa, I have to always have another job to have this job to help my people I have to have another job that's unacceptable um, and so we really need to do this because also as we are moving forward um, we want our our um, field to be able to expand right and truthfully those people who we had been focused on um, the you know boomers they're retiring. And so what are we going to do? Are we going to wait for another crop of, of, of um, white women to become middle class and high income enough to be able to afford to teach for us? Or are we going to look to the people and help to mirror our students and ensure that they that our field is a viable field? So Erin, if you can move to the next question at the next slide. How can we do that? So here's three pieces of the puzzle that I think is very important. And I just wanna pause and say thank you to you all who are, are saying thank you to me. Um, I can say that um, it is the support of others that make this slightly easier. Um, I've been talking about this for a really, really good time. I mean, for a really long time and uh, I'm happy to finally be getting some supports in this conversation. And so these are things that we have to start looking at. We talk about and advocate for these things for our students, 
Don't we, don't we advocate for family sustaining wages for our students? How dare we advocate for family sustaining wages for our students and have our teachers not have them ourselves? We have to be able to change that. Um, I implore, uh, I'm sure that there are funders on here. I am sure there are um, entities that have the resources to support us. Um, stop supporting new programming. Support the programming we are already doing and have it be to increase wages, have it be to increase the hours that people can, um, can work. I've seen so many of our teachers get burnt out by going from one to the next program and trying to figure out how to cobble together a full wage. A lot of times I am asked, how do we get these folks in here? We don't have the pool. There's no one here. BIPOC folks are not applying to this job. Well, if you, we all know that we live, truthfully, we live segregated lives for the most part. You have to be intentional for you to have a non-segregated life. And if you have that, great and wonderful, but most of us don't. And so our networks are filled with people just like us. And so if you are only looking at networks, and that's a really big thing that I touch on here is we do not, we cannot continue to only go by word of mouth recruitment. We cannot only go by, hey, staff, if you know two or three people, let us know. We, we have some openings. We need to open this up. And beyond opening it up, you need to go where the people are. You need um, people who speak Mandarin, then you need to go where people who speak Mandarin are, right? Uh, and so the same way that if you were looking uh, to, to do a, a big construction for your community college or something like that, you would go to uh, the construction industry and you would push that RFP out or you would push that information out of what your needs are. You need to do the same thing here. And so we're talking about HBCUs. We're talking about other minority serving institutions, Hispanic serving institutions. We're talking about community centers. Put it out there. If you are not connected to the community that your students are coming from, then you're already not doing the work the way that we need you to do it, to be able to diversify. Um, we've already talked about this. This was one of the main things that came up is we need, um, you know, antigorically focused uh, trainings. And the reason that this is important is um, the fact that many people of color BIPOC folks, we are told we need to be amazing. It is rare for us to be in a community that says, just be you, it's fine. No, we are expected to be at 110, 120, double the percentage. And yet we are being told in adult education, oh, you can come do this quick uh, training and go into the class. You know, we can hire you two days before the classes start and you'll be fine. Just jump in and go. That in and of itself puts us in a space that is very frustrating. That makes us feel that we are stepping into a class of our people unprepared. But that the way that um, adult ed has been preparing uh, folks, it is again based on our history and I respect our history. I love that we come from a philanthropic place, but that can no longer be. We are a field of education. The same way that K-12 teachers are expected to be trained well, and understand the needs of their students, understand the requirements of their graduation, et cetera. We have to start to do the same thing. We cannot continue to do these weekend throw off trainings here and there, cobbling together worksheets um, and things of that nature to pull together a strong staff who can really do the work that we need to do. And so these things, I think, are some of the main components to helping us to diversify our staffing. Um, I want to go to the next slide, please. And this is the last part of it. And so if you've read my article, um, you know that at the end, I give 
some really good and I, I hope tangible for many of you um, ways to do this, ways to diversify your staff. And the biggest thing is this right here. I know we are here for the students. Even if you, you came here because you were burnt out from K-12, um, even if you were, uh, you know, you were volunteered into <laughs> doing this, which happens quite often, uh, you are here for the students. And if we are committed to our students, then we need to really understand their needs. And the students need to see people in power who look like them. They need to be able to walk into a space and sometimes not have to explain a cultural understanding to sometimes not have to give um, an explanation and teach their teacher about them and their people. And the way that that can happen is through these ways of diversifying your staff. Diversifying your staff means that you are helping everyone who is a part of your staff, everyone who is a part of your program. And so in the same way that um, universal design uh, and universal design for learning helps and supports everyone, not just those who are differently abled as an example, this will help everyone. So now your white teacher don't have to maybe go to, you know, your their student and say, well, why do y'all say this? Or what does this really mean? Or why did you respond in this way? They may be able to actually go to a colleague and ask that question, right? Or do the research and then go back to that colleague and have a different kind of conversation than they could have because they now have people of color in their um, in their offices and able to talk and discuss these things as opposed to putting the burden on the students. And so these are just some of the things that I really think are important for us to continue to have a conversation around. Um, and the focus is, and if you could go ahead to the next slide, and I acknowledge that we are uh, seven minutes over time, um, but we are finishing up now. And I know there are a couple of questions and I really want to answer them. So if you can continue to stay on, that would be great. Um, Aaron, if we can go to the next slide, which should be um, so we've, we've discussed this. I'm not going to go over it anymore, but I do want to go to the last slide, which should be a slide. Yep, this is it. Uh, yes, diversity UDL. I, I am for it, Laura. We're going to talk because we're going to make that happen. Um, and so I, I just want to leave with this piece, which is from, uh, from my, uh, my article. And um, colorblind is in there. Um, for those of you who are doing colorblind teaching, who sees all of your students as the same, I hope that you understand um, what that really does. And I hope that we can all look to see ways that we can support our students as they are and who they are. Um, I will end with something that I often say in my trainings is that um, if you tell me you cannot see my color, you're telling me you cannot see me. I am Black, I am a woman, and those are major parts of my identity. And while I respect that you can see me just as a professional, just as a business owner, no, I don't see that you're a Black business owner. You can say that, but I need you to understand that that takes away my identity and that is a harmful act against our students. And so I'm going to end there. I know there are tons of questions. Um, and I do want to put um, one uh, link into our chat here. And that link is if you are interested in continuing this conversation, um, I am excited uh, to uh, have that conversation with you. Myself and my um, organization, we are pulling together actual conversations about about this and other diversity issues for specifically adult education. And so if you are interested, you're welcome to fill out this form and that will let me know that you want to continue this conversation. Uh, so we are gonna end there. I, wanna, I want Jen and Aaron, I'm gonna end there, we're not ending, uh, but Jen and Aaron to uh, 
come on board and Aaron, you can you can stop sharing um, so that we can just hear um, from you all from Jen and Aaron if you want to pull up anything that came to you during this time or if there were any uh, questions or comments from the chat that uh, sparked you. So I I you have me thinking about advocacy in a whole new way, Dequana. I mean, I, I really appreciated reading the paper and then and watching your video that 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 Coe put up where you talk about your paper. <laughs> and we talk a lot about raising funds for learners, and it's like professionalism of educators has almost become invisible as an issue in adult ed. And I think we are turning the wheel, like in the state of Minnesota, Aaron, where Aaron and I are from, we finally have um, a licensure program again. Um, and as other states are recognizing the need for adult ed, I really hope that we are intentional about embedding equity into the rebuilding, redevelopment, relaunching. But I would also just say in our advocacy for adult learning in general, we need to talk about teachers and the need for professionalization in the field. Um, if you go to the COABE site, I just chatted it again, or sorry, the NRS site and pull down the data about the educators, there's no question, there are no questions. Their states don't have to report how much they're paying teachers. They don't have to report the, the, the racial demographics of their staff. What gets measured gets attention. So I think there's room for advocacy at the federal level around issues like this too. Oh, I wonder, oh, I'm wondering is, if you're involved in any of that. So I, I'm starting to become involved. Um, and so uh, what I will say about that is, yeah, what's what's measured is, is uh, worked on, right? And so the fact that we have to keep for six months, you know, uh, at least knowledge of what our students are being paid right and if they kept their job and how many jobs they have and if it's part-time for all of that and not our teachers um and the same thing goes for for race we don't do the race of our teachers right that's not that's not a requirement now some places do um do it but it's not a requirement um and i think um under the leadership of um Yo johan Yuvin, um the department of education adult education sector did a small study and i think it was like six states and they couldn't even figure it all out from there right and so just there's so many things that are hidden pieces um uh to what we are doing uh and what we are missing yeah um Anything come up for you, Erin, or did it, were there any questions? I saw a question. Well, I was going to buy so fast. I was going to just fully agree with you. Um, I think um, this is something that IMAB has been working on for five or six years now, um, and I think part of our goal was that you know what we've seen is that a lot of the advocacy work that happens for funding in our field um, operates through administrators and managers, people who already are in that place of privilege that you talked about. And I think, you know, we need to know what the working conditions, what the needs are from the ABE professionals themselves, teachers and staff, and, um, and for, you know, for our learners and see how those struggles that, that those groups of people have are bound up together and that their liberation is also connected. Um, and I, I noticed that some people in the chat were saying that um, someone called adult education the stepchild of education, which I thought was very vivid. Yeah, um, I'm sure everybody loves their stepchildren who are here. But um, <laughs> I do think it's um, you know it's a it's a minority field, and then within that, some of these concerns are considered minority. And I also think you know before I came to this field over 10 years ago, I think a lot of progress was made to push it to a certain place. And it's time for that shift to happen again and for it to be pushed that much further where, um, you know, we have federal standards that we've had in place for about seven years now. We have all these professionalization measures and there need to be professionalization efforts for all of us who have invested in this field. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think also with your work, all of you, both of you, um, having having uh, people, BIPOC folks, having people who are um, a part of the communities uh, that 
uh, your people are coming from, your students are coming from, that in and of itself also, uh, you know, will trigger uh, some of the work that you all are trying to do, right? They will they will know and understand some of the programs, for instance, that will help them help students to get um, get technology. Uh, you know, uh, they will know and understand the connections that's happening at the community level for, for instance, in the immigrant communities that you support, Erin. And so really, you know, going forth in, in, in investing in your students through your, through your leadership, through your teachers. And I want to really say, I say teachers a lot. I don't just mean teachers. Uh, in actuality, you know, I truthfully am really tired of going to leadership meetings at the COAB uh, conference or other adult ed conferences and being one of the only few uh, people of color there, right? Um, and those who are people of color, they're coming from places where it's almost impossible not to have a person of color to be a leader, right? Um, what happens when we bring leadership in who understand the community and start that conversation at the higher level, right? We do so much. Our states who fund us, um, those who get funding from states, I'm telling you, the minute that the state changes something, you all are rewriting your whole programs, your whole design, right? What would happen if the state said to every uh, organization that's an adult education organization that your board has to represent, you know, has to have the same representation of your students, or, you know, has to have a 10% representation of your highest two, um, you know, racial minorities in your student population, right? I mean, just things like that, like there's so many spaces and places where we can push, and Erin, your point of, you know, we had this push of per professionalizing adult ed, and I know when I came on, came in and Erin, I, I had the same thing happen where people were like liking it, but kind of upset by it, the idea that it needed to be personal professionalized. And I was like, what's the problem? I don't see the problem here. We're a profession. You know, we should do more than just have a bunch of workbooks out on a table and photocopy in, right? And so, um, you know, I, 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 I I think everything that we're saying here is is and we can go on forever. Um, but I think everything we're saying here is such important. Um, questions um, and um, need to be answered and paid attention to. I wanted to see, I think um, Rachel may have had a question that I that people seem to have wanted me to answer. I saw something where maybe Dana said to Rachel, there's a good question. I want to end on that question, whatever it is. I don't even know what it is. Um, but uh, Dana or Rachel, I saw something pop up with the two of you um, during my time. So if you, either if you can write some type of uh, semblance of what that question was, uh, that would be great um, for us. And let me see, I believe it was Rachel. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to be, let me see if Rachel is still here with us. I think, um, I, I think I see it. I think she yeah, said, just reach out I would, it. I would love recommended literature for students of diverse backgrounds from teachers of those backgrounds for reading, especially easy reading for low level students. Here, I just reach out at that. Okay. So yeah, so um, I actually, and I chatted um, that I'm gonna try to see if there's any questions that, and you all are welcome to do this with me um, uh, that I missed that I, might just kind of like do a quick video response and try to see if we can add it to the COAB uh, email. I'm promising something that I did not ask COAB about, so. Uh, <laughs> sorry, they're redirecting me to a different question. So you can see it in the chat, Daquana. Sorry, okay. I misled you. Um, but when it comes to recommendation, that is, again, that's, that's what that diversity is all about. Um, and if you have that diversity, you're sitting down and it's not that you have to ask hey, Black person, what is that Black literature stuff, right? Hey, Latino person, is there some Latin? Um, people, no, you just start having conversations with, with colleagues and colleagues tell you what's up. So let's see, I think they were referring to a question above, are there areas in the country where they do pay livable wages with full-time jobs for ABE, ELL student teachers um, that we can show as an example? Such a great um, question. Yay, Rachel, Rachel, you've been doing amazing. Um, questions and, and stuff, I would love to connect with you. Um, so 
where there are some decent wages um, is actually, and I was a part of one of them and I'm very proud of that, but it's not easy. Uh, one of the ways that uh, some decent wages are coming in is through fund a different source of funding, which is charter schools. And so I've been a part of um, particularly, um, I'm from Maryland and live in Maryland, but uh, DC is uh, where a lot of charter schools have really prospered under adult education. And so it's strictly adult education, um, charter schools. And um, yeah, so, you know, uh, they're able to get per pupil funding that is in the thousands of dollars. I, I don't wanna quote a, a amount because I can't fully remember right now, but we're talking definitely over 3000. Let's put it, let's start there, 3000 per student. Um, and, you know, I know I talked to some people, I'm not gonna shout out the state where they're getting paid $300 per student. And I, I just, I just can't imagine. Um, and so uh, California, so DC, California, um, some of the states that have gone community college routes, but of course, and I saw someone um, put that in there and I am a, I'm an adjunct at a community college for undergrad. And so I know what they're talking about, uh, but that doesn't automatically uh, solve that problem because you'll end up ad adjuncting similar ways. Um, multiple adjuncts. Um, and so, uh, so I would say uh, California is the space to look in. Um, uh, Texas, I'm not sure about, but there were some things that happened that supported um, uh, things in Texas that may have allowed for a better uh, pay. And uh, DC are the ones that I know for certain. Um, and I'm, and women, if you know any, anyone else, that where there's a uh, good pay for AB student teachers. Well, I was just chatting. If if states are relying primarily on WIOA two for the for their majority funding, there it's not possible really to have great wages for teachers. States, I think, advocacy at the state level for increasing state funds is probably an, a, a good a good thing to try to do. I know that in um, in Minnesota, and then you know you need to advocate locally too. In Minnesota, I worked for St. Paul Adult Basic Education, and at the time, I had access to the same contract that the K-12 teachers had, because our public, our adult basic ed went through the public school system, and I, I I think that has to that was probably down to the union who 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 made sure that we were included in that. So this is probably more local and state advocacy work to boost wages than than looking to the feds to support. Um, and I was about to chat this, but um, someone mentioned Carlos Rosario. Um, and so they were one of the first charter schools in DC um, and adult charter schools in DC, but they also have really, really good foundation of money. So um, while I, uh, I, Carlos Rosario is one of the examples, um, but it also says like, we need to be doing our own money fund fundraising in that way, you know, and not um, the good thing about the charter school uh, allowances in DC is that it still allows you to do your own fundraising um, and things like that. So, um, you know, and the last thing, and I, it really is going to be the last thing because we're really over time. Um, and I thank you so much. Oh my God, all of you who stayed with us. Um, the last thing I'll say is we are the experts. And first, oh no, before I say this, <laughs> I am coming from a for-profit company structure, okay? So that's my mindset. But I also have been, you know, in nonprofits, in the community-based organizations, et cetera. We have to stop shying away from being the experts. We have to stop allowing our funders to come in and tell us how to be good programs. You need to go to funders with things that you are already doing, with things that you know work, and tell them it's going to work. Do, I understand they want their pet projects. I understand that they want that, you know, 35 uh, computer certificates in two weeks. You know it's not real. You are the expert. You as leaders, any leader in here, you should be bringing together your staff for every time that you have a grant, a funding offer and say, what is really possible? Because we are overworking ourselves trying to keep money that we should have never received because we, sh we could not make those outcomes because the outcomes aren't realistic, but it's not realistic because we're not putting our foot down and stop being afraid like we are a little step uh, stepchild, right? And put, put, put it down. You're the experts. 
You know, I love, again, I love that we're philanthropic and I love that we have all of this gushy love that we, we love our students, we want to hug our students. That is all good until you get to the business and we are, we are in a business. <laughs> this, this information was not approved by Kuwait, by the way. Like nothing we said today <laughs> before I get in trouble. Uh, <laughs> Today, though, Koei really, and um, I do want to say thank you because this is, um, it is easy for, for, for big organizations to just do enough, right? The, art, the journal was actually enough. They didn't have to bring in these other conversations. Um, and so um, thank you, Koei, for bringing in these other conversations. And most definitely because they just let us have it. They said, what, what this is your yours. Um, and so um, I, I want to say that, you know, my what I say is solely on Daquana Harrison, and that is it. Uh, so what is your goodbyes, ladies? How do you want to end this? I am a great moderator and starting up of a moderator. I'm horrible at ending it because I just want to keep on talking and keep having great conversations. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna start with Aaron because we started with Aaron and then Jen. So what's your goodbyes, Aaron? Um, I'm so energized by seeing all of these responses in the chat about um, these equity issues and how our learners deal with them, how we deal with them as well. And I feel like the more we organize these these discussions, the more we bring them to you know the people who uh, need to have these issues put in front of them together collectively, the further we get. And um, it, I need conversations like this to say, stay energized because it's a long discussion and a long fight. Um, so I learned a lot today. And I want to thank everybody for, for your participation. Thanks for being our fearless leader, Daquana. And thanks for everyone for coming. Um, I think you all will get all the materials. Um, so never fear. And all the links are embedded there. So take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. You should get an email that has the recording um, and a PDF of the slides, uh, minus our notes. Uh, and uh, look out for that, as well as a, a link to get a certificate of your attendance for today. Um, thank you. Um, thank you all for being brave and helping us to be brave with you. Have a good day. <laughs>